morning. You know, every time I hear that, <clears throat> I mean, I'm the one that picked the song, but every time I hear that intro music, I feel like I'm about to walk into a like stadium somewhere. I feel like I'm about to walk into like a pro football game or a basketball game or something, um, which is actually kind of, I guess it's kind of serendipitous, I guess, um, because every day that we walk out of our house, we're walking into a battle. You know, we're walking into some sort of conflict. You know, I, I'm likening it to sports and all that, but which, by the way, if you're a sports fan and you're a baseball fan, I am legitimately wearing black today um, in mourning for how pitiful the Atlanta Braves played in the playoffs. I made the statement earlier to Dan. We were talking, he, and I, I walked in. I said something about it, and he said, well, they, they really didn't play good. I said... No, they didn't, and I, and I made a bold statement. I said, I think that was the worst I've ever seen the Braves play in the last 10 years, and that's saying a lot because there have been some really bad Braves teams over the last few years, but I love, 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 even in the midst of, of something as simple as that and the, the heartbreak that comes from that and just the letdown that comes from that, that we serve a God who is so much bigger and, and cares, even in the midst of all of those things, cares about us enough that he still walks with us daily and will still talk with us if we will listen. Um, you know, I, I came in last week and I was, I, we kind of laid the foundation a little bit for this series. And I was telling Raquel this morning, and I'm going to say this to you guys too, like I, I, I have really struggled and wrestled with this series um, because, you know, some series are way more fun to do. Um, some of them are, are, are kind of really exciting to get into and kind of break things down and kind of help us move as believers into a new place where, where we can thrive and where we can grow. And then some of those series that are designed to do that, they really force us to kind of take a hard look at ourselves and look inside, and they're just not fun. Um, and, and this is one of those. This is a very difficult series. This is one that has been really hard for me to, to kind of... I don't want to say wrap my head around because I understand everything that God has shown me. And, and I, I, I take those things and I take them to heart. And, and I hope you guys know that when I, when I come in here on a Sunday morning and I sit here and I walk around and I start laying out what God has shown me, it's not something that I do lightly. Like I don't just pop in here after being in my office taking naps all week long like some people think. Um, Scott's laughing because it's an inside joke between me and him. Um, but there are people, like, reali realistically, who think that pastors, what we do is we just go into our office during the week and we take a nap and we just throw something together at the last second. I don't do that. Um, I, I, I really do. I, I spend time praying and thinking. And even, even something like this, like this series, isn't something that just, even though it hit our, our service planning stuff like a little over a week and a half ago, this is stuff that's been rolling around in my head and in my spirit now for over six months. So I don't take any of this lightly, and I say that as a disclaimer because this morning and the next couple of weeks um, are really going to be some hard topics um, to, to tackle because it calls into, into question a lot of what we've learned, things that I've been taught, things that I've had to come to grips with over the last several years, um, and bring into a place where it, there's finally some resolution in my spirit as to what Scripture teaches. Um, and, and honestly, if I can't get to that place, then I don't need to be presenting it to you guys. Because the Bible says that it's my job as, as the pastor to be able to bring stuff to help equip you to live the daily life that we're called to live. It's not my job as much as some, some churches play, lay it out there. It's not my job to make sure that your friends get saved. That's your job. So if you bring your friends to church, they're going to hear truth, but it's not going to be, I'm not going to be sitting up here preaching a salvation message to them every week. Even though the salvation message is part of what we do, my job is to equip you no matter how difficult it is to get out of my heart, no matter how difficult it is to wrap my head around. It's my job to equip you to do the things that are uncomfortable and to believe the things that are uncomfortable. You know, we started this whole series last week by talking about the, this idea that in life we experience a lot of things. We experience unbelievable highs, and we experience just incredibly low depths. And, and 
as an adult, we, we see those things and it affects us. And as children, it affects us completely different. And those things, a lot of times, go in and shape and mold how those experiences affect us as adults. See, what we've seen over the last several years, and, and a lot of it is, is in my generation, um, we grew up in a society, in, in a Christian worldview that taught us to pray by saying, God is great and God is good. And then at some point, you experience things that make you stop and go, well, if God is so great and God is so good, then why is this happening? Why am I experiencing this? Because this doesn't feel great or good. And when that happens, it causes us to kind of pull things back a little bit. Um, and it's usually when we experience some sort of heartache, some sort of, of, of loss, something that doesn't make sense to us in the realm of, of what we think God should do. Um, and when things just completely feel out of control. And we just can't seem to, to grab a hold of it. And we pray and we pray and we pray and we pray and we pray. God, bring this back under control. And then nothing happens. And, and, and we, we tend to back away. And because we're programmed to see that great is, God is great and God is good, and we see truth as truth, and we think that this is how the world works, we begin to see things in black and white. Of Well, if this is happening, then this must be the reality. If this is happening, then this must be why. And it's usually when we start seeing, um, seeing all those things happen, it's, it's a cause and effect kind of thing. If this is the effect, there must be a cause. And if this is what's happening, somebody, something, or, or, or some entity must have caused it. And so we start this, this place where we, we have to have a blame receipt. We have to lay the blame somewhere at somebody's feet. And we usually blame somebody else. We, we blame, uh, we, we look at, at ourselves and say, well, what did I do? We look at other people and say, well, it's their fault that we look at God. And sometimes we even look at Satan. And when we do, when we start looking at those things, we start asking one simple question. And it's the question, why? Why is this happening? Not just why is this happening, but why is this happening to me? Why is it happening to them? Who is the, the one to blame for this? And so last week, we started looking at, at this, this entire scenario that played out between um, Job and his friends and even between Job and God. And we saw towards the end of the book where Job lays out his entire complaint to God. He says, God, here's what I'm complaining about. If you had never let me be born, this wouldn't have happened. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, if you had done this, then this would not be happening. And God wasn't angered by his response. He wasn't angered by, by him asking the question, why? But what, Job, what God did do was say, okay, so I want to know who this is that's coming and blaming me. So now I want you to gird yourself up like a man and listen. Basically, he said, put your big boy pants on and listen because I got some things I need you to know. And so he starts asking Job all these questions. Okay, Job, you're complaining about this, but where were you when I did these things? Where were you in the midst of these things? Are you the one who decided to do these things? Are you the one who decided to tell the ocean it could come this far, the sun when to go, where to go at nighttime, the moon where to hide during the day? Was that you? And we finally come back at the end of the whole thing where Job answers God and he says, you've asked me this question and I realize I need to just keep my mouth shut because I realize that you are bigger than I am. My ears have always heard, but now I see. And we walked away by saying this, that when you don't know the why, you have to look to the who. You have to look to the one who can actually do something about it. You have to look to the one who is bigger than you. And we kind of likened it to this idea of as parents, where our kids, they get a little splinter in their hand or they get a small cut and it's, it's minuscule. Like they come running to us in pain and in suffering and they go, fix it. They don't come to us and say, why did you do this to me? I know I was nowhere near you, but why did you do this to me? They didn't understand what happened, but they came to the one who could do something about it. We find ourselves in those scenarios where we're tempted to play the blame game. We have to stop when we don't understand the why and look to the who. Now, typically for us in our world, <laughs> whether it's natural disasters, whether it's marriages falling apart, whether it's kids winding up in jail, whether it's a flat tire, whether it's your toaster freaked out and burned your toast 10 minutes longer than you wanted it to, we have a go-to that we blame. 
And we tend to say this, man, the devil is out to get me today. Some of us blame God for it, but most of humanity and a lot of us in church world, because we've reached that point where we say, well, no, God is great. God is good. So if anything is bad, is anything bad is happening to me in my life, it's because of Satan. It's Satan's fault. He's the one that's doing it. Satan is absolutely the father of all evil, pain, and suffering. Or is he? It got real quiet. See, here, here's the thing. Let me give you a little bit of backstory on Satan. Satan is not his name. Think about it. Our entire lives, we've heard our enemy, Satan, the devil. Satan is not his name. Satan is actually a Hebrew word that means the adversary. He is our enemy, but that's not his name. So if that's not his name, then who is he? If you go back through scripture, you actually find and you see that this, this being that we call Satan was actually an angel. His name was Lucifer. Lucifer was actually one of the, it, this is crazy to me. If you were to have a hierarchy of angels in heaven as far as who had, who had access to God and who had access to, to the CEO, basically, Lucifer would be one of those people. Lucifer was one of those angels. Lucifer was one that he could walk up to God and he could ask God a question. He could do whatever. And what's important to understand here is Lucifer is not God. Lucifer was a created being, just like we are created beings. And in reality, he is a lesser created being than we are because he was not made in God's image. We were created in God's image. Now, so what happened, okay? If Lucifer was one of these created heavenly beings that had access to God, how did he end up becoming this being that we refer to as Satan, the adversary, the tempter, our enemy? Well, he got a little bit big for his britches. And he wanted the same, he wanted to be, he didn't want to just be like vice president of operations. He wanted to be the CEO of the CEO. And God looked at him and basically said, you've lost your mind. I'm not giving you a promotion. So Lucifer steps back and he starts a rebellion using roughly a third of the angels in heaven. And God finally, he says, enough's enough. I'm not dealing with this. You're fired. And he kicks him out of heaven and he hits the ground. And it's, then once he's there, something changes for humanity. See, in Scripture, we, we, we talked about this last week in the book of Genesis. We all know the story. Adam and Eve were created. Adam was created in God's image. Adam went to sleep. God took a rib, created Eve. They woke up. God looked at it and said, man, this is very good. And then we see the serpent enter into the picture. Now, for generations, we've attached the name Satan to the serpent. With good reason, because in Revelation chapter 12, we actually see those words pop up. Our enemy, the devil that serpent of old, okay? So we attach the name Satan to the serpent in the book of Genesis because of that. And as a result, we lay all the blame at the serpent's feet, which isn't wrong. We lay the blame literally for almost everything that happens in our lives that's bad at the feet of Satan. The blame game goes into overdrive. I'm about to make some of you a little bit uncomfortable with where I'm gonna go. Because the reality is, is we lay way too much blame at the feet of Satan. We take a list this big, and at the end of the day, we go, Satan, I'm mad at you because you did this, 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 this. You made me late for work. My coffee was cold. My boss was in a foul mood, and I had to work late. I overslept, and I almost ran out of gas. It was raining, and it made the road slippery, and somebody almost hit me. And now I've had a terrible day. I've taken it out on my family. Satan, why are you after me today? And we've heard this amazing phrase over the course of our entire lives. You must be doing something right then. If Satan is coming after you that hard, you must be doing something right. Let that slip out of your brain. Because that's not what this is about, okay? Listen, 
Satan is not the all-powerful being that we think he is. Satan is not this person that goes in and, and can do whatever he wants. In, the, in fact, the book of Job actually shows us the full extent of what his powers are. He can cause natural disasters. He can cause loss of life. He can cause illness. He even in the process of the book of Job manipulates the thoughts of Job's wife. If you really want to get down to it, it doesn't explicitly say that. But I believe wholeheartedly, again, I believe, the Bible doesn't say it, I believe that he manipulates the thoughts of Job's wife. And I say that because in the New Testament, we actually see Satan enter into the body of, Ju of Judas Iscariot and take complete control to betray Jesus. If he can do that, he can manipulate the thoughts of Job's wife to the point to where she says, just curse God and be done. Curse God and die. Because that's what the entire thing was about, was getting Job to curse God. And it's scary stuff. It's scary stuff to think about all that. And it's what he wants. He wants us afraid of him. He wants us to see him as all-powerful. He wants us to see us as someone. He wants us to see him as someone who can do us harm. Because in some way, shape, or form, it... In his mind, it makes us want to curse God and move on. In some way, for whatever reason. But the thing is, is we've got it all wrong. We've got our understanding of what he is capable of completely wrong. He has all those powers, but there's a catch to it. If we go back to the book of Job, and we start all the way in Job chapter 1. If you have your Bible, you can go ahead and turn there if you want, because I want you to be able to see this. If you don't have a Bible, it's okay. It's going to be on the screens. For those of you that are watching online, it's going to be at the bottom of your screen there. But I want you to see this in your own Bible. Okay? I'm not making this stuff up. We're not just creating it and throwing, throwing it up on the screens. This is an account of what happens. Okay. Job chapter 1, starting in verse 6. Now, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the, lo before the Lord, and Satan also came with them, okay? So picture this. God is in his throne room, and all of the created heavenly beings come to present themselves before God, and Satan comes with him, okay? Satan is in the throne room of God, which is one of the, one of the things that just blows my mind about all this. And the Lord says to Satan, our adversary, from where have you come? And Satan answered the Lord and said, well, from going to and fro on the earth and walking up and down on it. He didn't say he was out tormenting people. He didn't say he was wreaking havoc. Didn't say he was causing problems with anybody. Didn't say he was making it rain so people would be late for work. Didn't say he was making their coffee cold. He just said he was going to and fro on the earth and walking up and down on it. And the Lord says to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? that there is none like him on earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. And Satan answered the Lord and said, well, does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? I mean, you've blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But if you stretch out your hand and touch all he has, he'll curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Now let's jump to chapter 2. Job chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. A second time this happens. And again, Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, from where have you come? Again, he asked him for an accounting of where he's been. And he says, well from going to and fro on the earth and walking up and down on it. Same thing that he said last time. Same exact thing. Not I was out causing trouble, not out I was trying to raise a rebellion against you, but I was out walking around on the earth. And the Lord says to Satan, have you considered my servant Job that there's no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God, turns away from evil, holds fast to his integrity, although you incited him against me to destroy him with no reason? I know I said that fast. But it's because I have a feeling, if we're made in God's image and it's my temptation to repeat myself that fast, God probably looked at him and said, hey, have you thought about this? I mean, even though you tried to get him to curse me and die, and he just said, nope, not going to do it. 
He said, have you thought about him? And he says, listen, skin for skin, all that a man has he will give for his life. But stretch out your hand and touch his bone and his flesh and he'll curse you to his face or to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, <laughs> behold, he's in your hand. Just spare his life. No big in-depth explanation. He says, you can touch him, but you can't kill him. You can make his life miserable, but you can't kill him. You can make it rough, but you can't kill him. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with loathsome sores from the sole of his foot to the, head of, to the crown of his head. Now, this is not the first time that there's an encounter like this. It's a little bit different in the New Testament, but the person involved in it is, is kind of interesting to me. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Here's what's so powerful about these, message, about these passages. We've read these passages as, as Christians a hundred more, or more times in our lives. I would venture to say that when I was growing up at least once a year, the pastor would do a sermon on the book of Job or on Job himself, and he would repeat these passages. And then we would go in towards, towards Easter when we would start understanding who Jesus was and starting to come to grips with his life and his death and his resurrection, and we would read that passage. We would read that one right there where he says, and the Holy Spirit led him out into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And we look at it, oh, man, well, that was because he needed to experience everything that we as humans experience. That's where we tend to run with that. Because everything he was tempted with was what we're tempted with on a, on, a, on a daily, weekly, monthly, yearly basis. But there's something in here that we overlook because we tend to, as Christians, just look at the surface of the passage. Because these passages tell us something about what Satan actually can do and about who he is. And what it shows us is that Satan absolutely 100% is not all-powerful. He is not omnipotent like God. He does not have full power, full authority. He is not omniscient. He doesn't know everything. He doesn't see everything. Because if he did, he would have looked at God and said, well, no, I'm not going to touch Job because I know he's not going to curse you. And he's not omnipresent. He's not everywhere all at once like God is. Because if he was... He wouldn't have said, I've been going to and, fro, to and fro across the earth, walking up and down on it. See, we tend to think that Satan is everywhere we go. We think he's like the Holy Spirit. We think he's like Jesus. Jesus actually said, I will never leave you or forsake you. I will go everywhere with you. Satan is not that way. Satan cannot be everywhere all at once. Now, he has a third of the hosts of heaven at his, at his disposal, but they are no different than he is. They are created heavenly beings just like he was. They were kicked out. They have the same powers and authorities. Satan was not able to do anything to Job without one thing. God's express permission. God was, or Satan was not able to even do anything. This is really mind-blowing wasn't even able to do anything to Jesus without one thing, God's permission. And here's what makes it even more interesting is the fact that with Jesus, the Holy Spirit actually led him out to be tempted. Can you imagine if Jesus would have, in the, while he was in the desert, would have stopped and been like, Dad, why are you doing this to me? Satan, why, why, what did I ever do to you? I must be doing something right because Satan's after me today. <laughs> I need you to understand something. If you are a believer in this room, okay, and when I say a believer, I mean someone who has placed your life, placed your heart in the hands of Jesus, and you believe that he actually was the son of God, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, was crucified, dead, buried, resurrected three days later, walked around on the earth for 40 days before he ascended into heaven with a promise that he would return. 
okay? And that you believed it so much that it actually changed your life and the way that you approach every single day. That's what I mean when I say a believer, okay? I need you to understand something. God will allow Satan to influence parts of your life. I'm going to say that again. God will allow Satan to impact your life in certain ways. And I'm going to tell you why. Because he knows where your limit is. He knows how far you can be pushed. That's why when he actually looked at Satan the first time, he said, everything he has, you can lay your hands on, but don't touch him. And then the next time it came around, he said, you can touch him, but you can't kill him. And I'm not just making this up because there is actual scripture. In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul is writing to the church in Corinth, and he says this in verse 13. There is no temptation that has overtaken you that is not common to man. Okay? There is nothing that you will ever be tempted with that nobody else on earth has been tempted our favorite thing to say is, well, I gave it. You just don't understand the pressure that this is. You don't understand. I am this way. You are not unique. As much as we want to believe that we are special and unique enough that Satan would tempt us in ways that nobody else ever has, get over yourself. You're not that special. You're special enough that God loved you enough to die for you, but you are not so special that Satan is going to tempt you in ways that he has never tempted anybody else. There is no temptation that has overtaken you. I love that word, overtaken. That means that you've given into it. There is no temptation that has overtaken you that is not common to man. But God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. Okay? You may give in, but it's not God's fault. It's not Satan's fault. In fact, he says, but with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. God loves you so much that even though he's allowing you to be tempted, he's going to provide a way out of the temptation. All you got to do is actually look for it. I'm going to be honest with you. I am terrible about this because I have tunnel vision. Those of you that have been around me and know me for a while, you, I'm sure that you've been very polite and have noticed that I am not quite the slender, svelte human being that I was three years ago. I've gained back quite a bit of the weight that I lost simply because I have tunnel vision. And once I see Oreos or chips, I have to have them. Now, I know there's Oreos sitting here and there's apples and bananas and... That would be the better choice. God provides a way out, but I have been overtaken. <laughs> I've not, no, I am not so unique that nobody else in the world has been tempted with their favorite cookie or their favorite whatever. I am no different than you in the fact that I get overtaken by it on a daily basis, but in the process of it, God provides me with an out. I just don't ever look for it and take it. And so what happens is then I look at myself in the mirror and I go, man, I'm so angry with myself. But man, if Satan hadn't, it's not biblical. Here's the thing. God will absolutely 100% give you more than you can handle. Okay, we love that phrase. Well, I, man, I just, I know I fell, but I know God's not going to give me more than I can handle. Baloney. He will absolutely 100% give you more than you can handle so that you have to actually look for the way out that he's providing for you. It's not Satan's fault that you got overtaken by your temptation. It's not Satan's fault that you ended up in a scenario where you were late for work or that your coffee was cold. And the reality is, is that same thing is true of non-believers too. I hear a lot of non-believers say, well, I just, you know, I just, I, if I go back into this, if I go here, I'm going to be tempted. Well, guess what? You know you're going to be tempted, but God's giving you a way out. He's providing a side door for you not to go this way to be able to get where you need to be. Believer, non-believer alike, God will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can handle. 
Because in your temptation, he will provide a way out for you. The problem is with us is we don't look for the way out and then we blame God or we blame Satan or God, either one, whenever we get overtaken by it. We tend to blame, we put blame on Satan while God is proving to us that we can handle it. Every step of the way. Because God tells Satan how far he can actually go with you. Believers, there are some things that Satan absolutely can 100% do, but God tells him how far he can go when it comes to you personally. Not everything that happens to you is Satan attacking you. Not everything that happens to us is Satan's fault. We just give him way too much credit for it. For example, sometimes things just happen. I'm going to have to ask her for forgiveness for this later because I did not ask her if I could share this story. When we moved into our house um, a few years ago, my girls loved to run around in the front yard. They still do. They still like to get out in the yard with the dogs and play. At this time, we did not have a dog. But as she was running around in the front yard, Micah stepped on something slippery and went down and slid right through a pile of something that one of the neighborhood dogs had left in our yard. Some of us would have popped up and been like, Satan, why did you let that happen? Satan did not send that dog to go to our yard to leave a pile right there so that Micah would come through, slip in it, and slide all the way through it. It just happens Coming out to your car to a flat tire one morning when you're, on, when you're in a hurry is not Satan's fault. It means that you ran over something. Or maybe you made somebody mad at work and they sliced your tire. I don't know. Your coffee being cold when you set it down an hour and a half ago before walking out the door does not mean Satan wants you to have a bad day. It just meant you set your coffee down an hour and a half ago and things don't stay hot for an hour and a half. The things that happen to us a lot of times are are caused by our actions. They are consequences of things that we've done. Let's go all the way back to Genesis. The only person that had any absolute reason 100% to say, Satan made me do it, or the devil made me do it, was Eve. But even then, she tried to take the way out. The serpent said, listen, did God really say that if you eat of the the fruit in the garden that you're going to die? He said, no, no, no. He said that if we eat that fruit, we're going to die. She tried to take the way out, and Satan said, you're not going to die. He just knows it's going to make you like him, which is what I wanted to be. And if I can't be it, nobody's going to be it, but go ahead and eat that anyway. And she was overtaken by the temptation. Adam was not dealt a blow by Satan. He was dealt a blow by the consequences of Eve's actions. He was tempted and chose to eat what she was offering him because the Bible says that she took it, ate it, and saw that it was good to eat. It tasted good. It was fun. It made her feel good. The consequences of her actions put her in a scenario, in a position to cause consequences for Adam which then in turn had a consequence for all of humanity. The person that ran a red light and hit you, that wasn't Satan. They made a decision that had consequences that affected you. The marriage that you're in, Satan's not out to destroy your marriage. Maybe he is. But have you considered also the fact that maybe the marriage you have is a result of the decisions that both of you have made? Raquel and I, the marriage we have, we don't have by accident. We fight for our marriage. We do and say the hard things. We don't have the family that we do because it was handed to us. We have the family that we do because we work hard for it. The relationships that you have, the experiences that you have, they are always, always, always going to be consequences of the decisions that people make around you and that you make. It's not always something that Satan is out to do to get you. 
And it doesn't mean that you're doing something right. Because I have met some people who are so far away from God that have used that same excuse, man, I must be doing something right because Satan's after me. No, if you're not a believer, Satan could care less about you. You're right where he wants you. Not everything is Satan's fault. Quit giving him credit for it. Because when we start giving him credit for it, we start putting him on the same level of, as God. Which is where he wanted to be, and it's the exact same reason that God kicked him out. Because he wanted to be like God. When we start giving him credit for the consequences of other people's actions and consequences of our actions, we place him as someone with powers that he does not have. It is not his fault that you are in the scenario you are. It's yours. If you want to see Satan working in your life 90% of the time, just look in the mirror. Because you become your own Satan. Because remember, Satan is not the devil's name. It's Lucifer. Satan means adversary or enemy. As believers and as non-believers, we are, we are our own worst enemies. So place the blame where the blame actually deserves to be. So what in the world then, if that's the case, what do we do? If sometimes he's going to tempt me and I'm going to give in, or sometimes maybe it just happens to be dog poop in the yard, what do we do? How do we shift out of this blame game? How do we shift into somewhere that's more healthy as a human being and as a believer? Well, I say it's simple, but it's not all that simple. You stand firm in your faith. Okay, you have to stop and look at the who that can do something, that actually legitimately has power, that actually legitimately has the ability to do anything without handcuffs and stop looking at the what. Because if you get so wrapped up in the what, you're eventually going to just give up. You're eventually just going to say, well, God doesn't love me. And even, and this is, this is why this is so important, because even knowing, even knowing that Satan can only do so much without God's permission, it tends to make us want to blame God. But you have to fight that urge. Because God loves you enough to set a fence that says how far Satan can actually go with you. God loves you so much that he said, Satan, you can only come this far and no further because they are made in my image. He knows you. God himself is omniscient. He sees it all. He knows it all. He is omnipresent. He is with you every step of the way. When you persevere in the midst of those struggles and you realize I can stand firm in this because God is with me as a believer, it changes everything. The circumstance changes. You know, last week I kind of likened this whole thing to a kid getting a splinter in their hand. This is how I view this. As a parent, one of the things that always broke my heart was watching my kids cry. Especially, I mean, the older they've gotten, but especially when they were toddlers and they were first learning how to walk and they didn't understand how life worked. They would walk into a room and they would hit their head on something or they would trip and fall and just boom. But here's what they would do. They would pop up and they would look around. Now what we've been taught is that our kids do that to look and see if anybody saw it because they were embarrassed. And then when they see you, they start crying because they're embarrassed. No. What's happening is this. They know that their parents love them. And they know that their parents will comfort them. So when they fall flat on their face, they pop up and they look around to see if the comfort giver is nearby. So when they pop up and they see the comfort giver, they break down because they know I'm safe now. When you fall flat on your face, do you pop up and look around for the comfort giver? Or do you look up in embarrassment and then cry because you see the one who loves you? Seeing you do something dumb. Because both reactions are valid and we always do one or the other. 
Imagine what would have happened in the garden if instead of Adam and Eve being embarrassed by the fact that they had fallen, I wonder, I don't know this, but I wonder if instead of hiding when God came into the garden, if they would have looked at him and just broke down sobbing and ran to him and said, I am so sorry. We broke the rule. Will you please forgive us? I cannot tell you how many times I wonder how life would have been different on this earth or if it would have been different. If they would have looked up in their embarrassment because they fell and had seen God for who he was. Because the reality is this, is the one that is in our corner is way more important than what's happening to us. God is with us everywhere we go. James chapter 1, verses 2 and 4 says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Count it as joy. Wait, what? Yeah. Count it as joy when you meet trials of various kinds because you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. That's why Job was able to stand the second time because he persevered under the pressure that Satan put him under the first time. So what happens when steadfastness is produced in us? It says, let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. In a nutshell, when you count a trial as joy and see it as an opportunity to draw close to God, it refines you. It makes you stronger. It makes you better. It deepens your faith. You become whole. And it does something for us that we can't hardly wrap our heads around. Our steadfastness in our trials becomes our testimony. And it shows people who God is through the life that we live. Faith in the face of trials and struggles. We've got to quit blaming Satan for everything and understand that what we are experiencing is something that God has allowed because he knows that we can handle it. That if the going gets tough, he's also provided a way out. If you would just look for it. Not everything is, fa- is Satan's fault. Sometimes it's just poop in the yard. My question to you is this. Are you willing to look up from falling face down and realize that there's another standing in the fire with you? Or are you just going to be content to pop your head up and give more power and authority to someone that doesn't deserve it? Only you can do that. Some of you in this room are going, you don't understand what I've been through. You're right, I don't, but somebody does because they've experienced it. You don't understand what my temptations are. You're right, I don't. And you don't understand what mine are. But there are people out here who do understand your temptations. And some of those people actually overcame them instead of being overtaken by them. Because they saw where God left a way out and they ran with it. This morning, I really want to challenge you to do something. In just a second, when the band comes back up and and we play this last song, I want you to stop in your circumstances where you are right now. Whatever heartache you're going through, whatever struggle, whatever trial, whatever temptation. And if you're a believer, I want you to do one simple thing. I want you to look and see where Jesus is in relation to where you are. Because he said he'd never leave you or forsake you. 
but he's got to be pretty close. For Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he was literally in the fire with them. With Daniel, when he was in the lion's den, he literally was the one that shut the mouths of the lions. So where is he in your struggle? For those of you who aren't believers, honestly, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, I, I really don't. Because until you lay your life in the hands of Jesus, you are nonstop going to be tempted left and right. And even after that, you're still going to be tempted left and right. But until you lay your hands, your heart, your heart in the hands of Jesus, excuse me, you don't belong to God. And you will be weak. You will not persevere in your faith because you have no faith. At least not in God. You have faith in something, but it's not in God. So my question to you is, what is keeping you from doing? What is it that is holding you back from laying your life in the hands of the Father? That's my challenge to you. Ask yourself that simple question. And if you have questions, if you say, well, the reason I haven't is because I don't understand this, or I don't understand this, or I don't understand this, come talk to me. And I will help you find answers to your questions. And if I don't know the answer, I'll tell you, I don't know the answer. But I'll pray with you that God will give us the answer. We've got to start looking to the one who has the ability and has all the power instead of looking so intently at the what. Father, thank you so much for who you are. I thank you that you want so much more for us than for us just to walk through life blaming everything on Satan. And God, I wholeheartedly believe that when we can put him in his rightful place, that it will change everything for us. That it will deepen our faith, it will draw us closer to you. Father, help us to be stand steadfast so that we can persevere in our faith, so that you can refine us and make us perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Father, I pray that you will remind us over and over and over again that there is absolutely 100% another in the fire. And Father, if there's someone in this room or someone watching online that doesn't know you, I pray that you'll give them the courage to ask the questions that they need answered. Father, show them how much you love them and remind them that you died for them. In Jesus' holy name we pray.